Please. So they're they're plump, fresh out of whatever. Out of school. Coyote school. I want to put a coyote in my basement so it eats whatever mice, and then they can go, and I'll pay it like 20 That's just going to make the coyote bigger, though. Mm-hmm. Well, you know they're what? They're already I, really big. If I That's integrate it... Coyotes I, are famous for not honoring contracts. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking you never about? Never sign with a coyote. No. Ever. They're, they're great consumers. No. They always buy packages, <laughs> if not on an episodic basis, a <laughs> weekly basis. Oh, I'll be right back. What, like one minute. And All they right. buy the big oh. ticket items, right? Large rockets, rocket powered yep. roller skates, yep. springs of large size if coyotes portable, are known for anything pedal. it's that they love roller skating yeah. acme acme should uh should sue amazon for patent infringement <laughs> oh and umbrellas lots and lots of umbrellas uh-huh. portable tunnels those are my favorite the portable tunnels i will say i was very proud of otis over the weekend um he does not care for cockroaches and the reason i know this is because mm-hmm. for some reason don't even want to get into it. There were like several dying cockroaches on our walk. Mm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Something happened. Some pest control or something. something yeah, 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 exactly. And he was sort of like, hmm, couldn't be bothered. If he sees a squirrel, then all bets are off. But he doesn't seem to care about insects. A uh, reminder to people watching on YouTube, uh, (laughs) if you don't watch live, nothing should change. We will continue to upload the show to YouTube uh, and you will continue to watch it. You're bound to do that now. Sorry. But uh, if you like to watch live, remember that on June 3rd, we're we're going live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash good day internet. Don't let this confuse you before June 3rd uh, because we're not there yet. But we will be moving over to Twitch on June 3rd. Twitch.tv slash Good Day Internet for the live version of the show. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and thank you to uh, uh, Theater Monkey and W. Scottis One and BioCow who are helping uh, in various ways with the Switch. Uh, w. Scottis One, if that's news to you, I made you a mod today. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, oh, Godzilla opens this weekend. I want to see it. It's I don't know why. It's probably going to be really bad, but I want to see it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We'll see. I have a feeling it's going to be really bad. I think we have it on the movie draft, so please go watch it. I um, think you should just watch Aladdin again since I have that in the movie draft. Uh, we have that too, so you can go watch that too. That or John Wick is another good one you could watch. I have that in the movie draft. <laughs> I, uh, this is, this is old. It's not in a current movie draft, but I finally saw Us over the weekend. Um, took me a while. The Jordan Peele horror movie. Oh, oh, I haven't seen right. that yet. Oh, I want to see it. I you can talk about it. Go I didn't think it was good at all. No, some people don't like it. It's not everybody's taste. No. Oh. Weird, because I I knew of it as like, this is like the best horror movie ever. You know, all the accolades, all the awards. And I watched it, and I was like, didn't think it was good at all. Well, so are you a horror movie Horror, no, horror but I, I, I'm I'm sort of like I shy away from horror movies in general if I think that they're going to be really scary because I'll have nightmares. This was not even really scary. I just sort of watched it and was like, I don't understand it, why this it, movie was made. Was it gory? Like I want I don't mind scary no, movies. I don't no, like it gory. Really movies. gory. I mean, it, no. it, a couple places, but that's not that's not the thing. It, it was it was more of a you you have to be sold on you know the. The you know the, the villains oh. of, of the movie, and I was like, they're not scary. This seems really silly to me. All right, you guys uh, ready to take a break and do some tech news? Yes. Robert, are you ready? I am. Excellent. Let me pull up the show notes. We uh, Wait, tech go. your mic real quick, Robert. Uh, yep. let me stick it right here. Cool. Awesome. Here we go. In three, two. Monty Vanderbilt has supported independent tech news directly for around five years. Be like Monty. Become a DTNS member at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 28th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And uh, from uh, Parts Unknown, I am the show's producer, Roger Jank. 
And I'm the intern, Anthony Lemos. Also producing the show today. Uh, and joining us, uh, co-host of AVXL and HDTV reviewer, Robert Heron. Welcome back, Robert. Hey, thank you. Always good to be with you guys. Always good to have you here uh, to tell us what's going on in the fast-moving world of televisions and TV th and home theater. Let us start, however, with some Computex things you should know. AMD announced the three first three new chips from the third gen Ryzen lineups will arrive July 7th. They are a two seven nanometer Ryzen 7 CPUs and the first Ryzen 9 all on the existing, existing AM4 socket and claiming to be the first PCI Express 4.0 compliant desktop platform. The Ryzen 7s double total memory cache to reduce memory latency. AMD also announced the first GPU to use its new Navi architecture. The seven nanometer Radeon RX 5700 features GDDR6 uh, memory, Delivery in 25% better performance per clock per core and 50% better power efficiency than existing Vega based cards. The RX 5700 will be released sometime in July. It's hardware palooza at Computex. NVIDIA announced Turing based Quadro RTX professional laptop cards. The Quadro RTX 5000 has 3,072 CUDA cores, 384 Tensor cores, and 48 RT cores paired with 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 RAM. 17 laptops from Asus, Dell, HP, MSI, Razer, Gigabyte, and Acer will carry the new cards with the branding RTX Studio. Aside from the cards, the laptops will also feature the NVIDIA Studio Stack, a software SDK, and APIs designed to speed up video editing, rendering, and vector animation. According to NVIDIA, RTX Studio laptops will start at 1600 bucks, starting in the second half of the year. ARM also announced the Cortex A77 CPU and the Mali G77 GPU. ARM claims that the Cortex A77 improves performance by 20% per clock over the previous A76, with 25% better machine learning performance as well. The Mali G77 GPU uses the Valhall GPU design with 40% overall better performance and 30% more power efficiency than its predecessor. It also runs machine learning interference and neural network loads 60% faster. And let's see, AMD, ARM, uh, what NVIDIA, oh right, Intel. They still make chips. Intel showed off the core i9-9900KS. It's an eight core, 16 thread processor capable of running all cores at a turbo frequency of five gigahertz. Technically, the CPU has a stock frequency of four gigahertz, but it'll only run at that frequency if a motherboard uses default Intel BIOS, which generally isn't the case. Intel confirmed this isn't new silicon, Rather, i90-9900K chips specifically are binned to run at the higher frequency all the time. Pricing, release, and power consumption were not announced. Intel also announced it will start the 10th generation of its core line of processors codenamed Ice Lake with the series of laptop-oriented chips. So there's the chip. The chips were all down at Computex. Uh, if you wanted to know <laughs> or up. Chips. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the, the chips were up for the chips that were down at Computex. Depends on how you phrase it. Anyway, let's talk a little more about uh, Apple announcing a new product. I'm excited. What is it, Sarah? Oh, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Apple announced an update to the iPod Touch, which includes an A10 Fusion chip and a new 265, uh, 256 gigabyte storage model. Now you might say, is that really relevant? Well, it's the first update since the sixth gen iPod Touch was released back in 2015. So you know it's four years in the making. The new iPod Touch starts at 199 for the 32 gig model, 299 for the 128 gig model, or $399 for the new 256 gig model. I'll be honest, I never thought Apple would update this product line again. I figured they would just phase it out. Uh, and, and figure, you know, people just buy the cheapest iPhone available and maybe pop the SIM card out if they wanted to give it to a kid or something uh, and not give them a connection. But uh, this this is there because somebody's going to buy it. Do any of us, Robert, do you have any idea who the market for new iPod touches are? Maybe, maybe somebody who wouldn't want to use their mobile device and a streaming service or you're not into doing it yourself with your mobile device, which probably already has a really good you know, audio digital converter built into it uh, or analog digital converter. I, for me, it's it's definitely not for me. But if if you wanted that standalone device, though, that could just literally store all of your compressed tunes and be able to take that with you anywhere, like on the plane or or somewhere you're not generally going to have Internet access, that it could be cool. But I have 
gigs of storage in my phone, plenty to hold all the songs I could possibly listen to in a month. So it, yeah. it, it, it ain't for me. To me, this seems like, um, you know, it has an advantage over, you know, again, like swapping out a SIM or taking it out and, you know, giving it to your kid because it can run the latest iOS better. Um, and the idea that it's not a phone, but it could play lots of games as long as you have a Wi-Fi network also makes sense to me. The price is high for that. But I think that Apple is is banking on the fact that it wants more and more people to be subscribed to its various services, and the iPod Touch would be another way to do that. So the Touch still runs all of the iOS apps for the most part, just like the yeah. phone would. Okay, so that yeah. there's a great use yeah. case, and like you said, for kids, or and, and, and it may be a limited use case for, for what you're talking about, Sarah. But it's cheaper than a phone, right? The the equivalent exactly phone, same storage level are are quite a bit more expensive. So yeah. The World Wide Web Consortium, a.k.a. the W3C, has decided to hand over development of HTML and DOM standards to the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, or what I will now refer to as What WG. Uh, <laughs> What WG was started by browser developers. Uh, the, the developers were originally at Apple, Opera, and Mozilla. Uh, one of the Opera guys moved to Google. So now the group is made up of people at Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla. And that group was founded in 2004 to help speed up development of HTML standards. The group actually developed HTML5 and led the effort to get W3C approval for it. In 2018, the W3C and what WG differed over version 4.1 of the document object model, or DOM, which was not approved. And because of that dispute, they've now worked out an agreement. Under this new agreement, W3C members will draft recommendations to be given to what WG. And then what WG will consider those and include them or not include them in the HTML and DOM living standards. So the standards will be continually upgraded. There will not be this process where the browser makers put things in their browsers and then three years later, they become part of the HTML standard. Uh, this is hoped to speed that system up so that you have the living standard that gets continually updated. And it's updated by people who work on the browsers and know what features are going to be implemented in the browsers and which ones won't work. I guess my question is, and, and this all makes sense as far as, you know, Things move quickly. You know, you 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 want to make a, a, a enhancements to a browser and not have to worry about the W three uh, C to say like, yes, this is fine. Does the W three C need to exist? Yes, I, it absolutely does because you need that organization that looks over all of these various standards. They do more than just these two. Uh, and I actually think this is the best way to do it. People who are like, browsing standards affect me, but I don't make a browser, can now give their recommendations of, hey, this is going to affect the apps I make, the services I run. I'm not a browser maker, though, so I have different considerations. I, I think this is a better way to do it. HP first released the original Omen X backpack VR system back in 2016. Do you remember that? Now it's got an updated version with the same case, same dock, but a more comfortable form factor and updated specs. The notable thing is that the Omen X is not only compatible with HP's own Reverb headset, but also the V, the Vive, the Oculus, and any other VR headset as well. When not used as a VR backpack, the main computer chassis can live in its dock and be connected to a traditional display a mouse, and a keyboard like a regular PC. Demos of the pack include OSHA training and a virtual trip to Helsinki. <laughs> that plus the 3300 price tells you that HB is still targeting this for commercial use. I like this. I mean, it's not a big development, to be honest, except it makes it more comfortable. When you're talking about backpack VR, that's a huge Huge and that's, that's always been the issue with yeah. you know with VR, right? It's like, yeah, like how clunky is it? You know, the, the more comfortable it, it is, the better. Especially when you're talking about carrying it on your back. It's not just comfortable on your head. It's a backpack with a computer in it, uh, basically. And I, I, I wonder how many businesses need this level of VR for training. I would think, you know, some desktops sitting at desks with VR headsets for OSHA training might be good. But this does open up what you can do with them because it allows you to walk anywhere. There's no restriction on where you can go as long as you have that inside out sensor on the headset itself and you're not relying on trackers, which is the common thing with headsets now. Uh, you, you know, There's a safety issue, obviously, of where you should and should not walk, which is hilarious when you're talking about OSHA training, but it does free <laughs> you up to, 
to, to have a more flexible application on these things. Well, I've never been to Helsinki, so I'm excited to try it out. <laughs> Obviously that too. Robert, what do you make of this stuff? It's interesting. It's it just seems like a hack until we have phones powerful enough to drive these kind or at least smaller computers that have superb all day battery life that could still drive a VR headset. Granted, you ain't getting 4K for two eyes at 120 hertz or 90 plus hertz out of any mobile device right now. So if it still requires the backpack. And if they can somehow maybe incorporate enough battery power to make it truly portable, especially if you're going to be using this commercially, likely in different scenarios and scenes, be it indoors or outdoors, I, I don't want to be tied to an extension cord. It, it, otherwise, I might as well just set it up in a room and do it all there. Uh, if it were more like an augmented reality setup, I could see this being even more practical because then you still have the vision of everything around you and you're just simply overlaying the data like that. And you could do a lot of cool development and other, other projects using a system like this, but a $3,300 backpack just to have VR be a little more portable. Mm, I'm more. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to, even, even though I, I, I see the technology moving forward, it's hard to hear a story like this and not be like, one of these days we're all going to laugh at the fact that the backpack got lighter or more comfortable. Remember when people like actually put VR in their backpacks? Like it does seem like a stopgap measure for now at the same time, because you know, it, people are trying to figure out how this all works. It's uh, it sounds like it's, it's, you know, moving in the right direction. Yeah. I, the question to me is, do you want, like Ro Robert said, do you want your phone to power your headset or do you want the headset to have everything built in? I prefer uh, eventually, <laughs> yeah, eventually that will be the question of like, do you yeah. want your phone to power it? And then, you know, you could even keep your phone in your pocket potentially, and it will just, you know, send it to a, send its power and display to the headset. Or do you want the headset to be independent and be its own device? Or maybe just maybe something like uh, Google Stadia and being able to do more backend computing and then just fully get the headset down to nothing but the display system yeah, yeah. and all the wireless uh, the wireless networking and other performance that would need to occur for something like that. Maybe this is what they're aiming that at as well, where it's more for commercial development. Of oh yeah, this is absolutely for commercial so. development. They're they're leaving the door open for gamers who want to just say, yeah, I have a cool backpack uh, VR. But this is, <laughs> yeah, this, but the, like the price most point VR. is, yeah. Most VR is is aimed at businesses these days. That That's where you can find people who can afford it and want it. Sony's launching a low power wide area or LPWA chip for Internet of Things devices to take advantage of Sony's proprietary LTRES network launching this fall. The LPWA chip can transmit up to 60 miles, 60 miles. Uh, it also works well in urban areas with a lot of potential interference and can work on high speed objects like cars and trains. The LPWA chips have a much longer range than Wi-Fi and use less power than cellular. Uh, Wi-Fi is, is great, but it doesn't work over long distances and cellular is great, but it eats up your battery. This doesn't do either. It's perfect for internet of things. The CXM 1501 GR chip, as it is called, transmits signals in the 920 megahertz band and can use GPS or global navigation system to tell time and location use cases include things like bicycle and car rentals, knowing where they are, uh, locating ships uh, that are that are doing shipping transit, uh, home delivery. You can actually track the package itself, not just by scan. Uh, boat races, monitoring when your train or bus is going to come, even things like street lamps, uh, being able to tell you if they're working properly, if the amount of lighting in a smart city is proper. Uh, they they put one out about helping friends find each other on ski hills where it's you know pretty vast and hard to see people. So he's going to start with a build out in Japan and we'll see how it goes from there. All right. So dumb question. Uh, this sounds great for a lot of moving parts. Why wouldn't it replace Wi-Fi in the home? Um, because it's not powerful enough to do all the data you want. This is like a small amount of data, right? That's my guess, uh, is, th is that this is, this is about, uh, I need to get the internet of things, amount of data across a long distance. Got it. It's not about routing the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, man, I, you know, as a, as a person who seeks to live on a train one day, I, I love the idea of this. Um, and it, yeah. Uh, like maybe a ski slope doesn't really apply to me, but but I get what they're going for here. And uh, it sounds like the, the tests, at least uh, so far, have been really promising. 
It could also possibly be used as just a like an over the top tracker as well, something like the uh, tile mm -hmm. chips used to be. And if you could do something that truly had its own well beyond Bluetooth range, where you know a few miles even through buildings and things like that, and to be able to you know have it at least send out say the GPS coordinates for where that object is, and if you could then have the whole thing nice and compact and last a few years with low yeah. power, that would be fantastic. This isn't going to stream Netflix. Uh, no. But if you just need a, a, a light or, or a bus to be able to say, I'm here, I've looked at my GPS and I know where I am, uh, that, that's what this is for. I'm curious if there's any non-proprietary versions of this under development as well out there. If anybody's aware of that, send us an email. I've that, seen several that. chips like these in other just people putting together cool uses as to what to do with this technology. And there's, I want to say Sierra Wireless is one company. I don't know if Sony worked with them on this at all, but... There are a few companies out there making these types of chips and to make them as low power as possible, just so that you can literally make a portable device with, say, one of those coin cells, lithium ion cells, yeah. that literally last a few years and, and make it a just a and or user user repairable in terms of just being able to swap a battery out and, and to have that distance and to do cool things with it for, you know, be it minor data transmitting or I don't know, it, it's kind of like. Figure Great out smart cities, <laughs> smart city stuff where you need wide range because you don't know exactly where you, you might want to be collecting the data at any point, uh, especially as cities grow. And then you could also think too, in the, along that same line, it's just something like location data, having small devices that are in fixed locations able to transmit a specific, I am exactly right here. And if your phone can see mm -hmm. that, then mm -hmm. even indoors, you would know exactly where you are. It could fold into something like that too, which would be fantastic. On to Africa, everybody. Are we ready? The BBC reports on a container with solar panels pulled by a donkey. Yes, a real donkey that uses touchscreens to improve digital literacy in Mozambique. That country sits between South Africa and Tanzania. Now, while Kenya, which is in the news often, two countries to the north has 91% mobile penetration, Mozambique as less than 50%. The project is called Community Tablet. It's founded by Mozambique's Day Armad. A three minute movie plays to introduce people to the topics. There are prizes like t-shirts and caps that are given out. And the audience can use smaller touchscreen tablets to answer questions about what they saw. The idea to educate and empower communities on topics like public health, mobile banking, and also voting. Yeah, this is great because uh, a lot of times these these education efforts uh, will uh, involve pamphlets, uh, just to, and people just throw those away. Says uh, right. Day Amon. Uh, so this is a way to just get people's attention because you're giving away caps and t-shirts and you got this big old container and they've got the touch screens and it's fun and it's it gets people to uh, interact with it learn a little bit about what they want to teach you, whether it's about voting plans or, or mobile banking or, or whatever, and then spread the word and tell other people who then come back. So uh, he's he wants to make this a franchise. Uh, he, he's been getting funding from NGOs, uh, so he would like to do this more often. But I just found it a fascinating use of technology. It's like, let's not worry about connectivity. Other people can worry about that. How can I take technology and combine with, with what I know and what works yeah. and go and teach people in my own community because he's from Mozambique. And he said he was inspired by his kids. He saw his kids looking at YouTube and figuring out how-to stuff. And he's like, man, if I could just take a screen that shows how-to stuff to people in rural areas, uh, suddenly we could educate people a lot better. So that's well, what he and, did. And when you're talking about a, you know, a, a country with, with many people, many residents, uh, internet literacy under 50%, there's so much potential, you know, like, does it go the right way or the wrong way? You know, that, that has, has yet to sort of, uh, prove itself, but, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a really good place to try something like this out. Folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, Robert, uh, I know you were at Display Week in San Jose not too long ago, uh, looking at a bunch of display technologies. What did you see? Heck yeah. Uh, there were lots of cool new 2019 TVs they were showing off, of course. But I think right off the bat, I'll talk about some of the future tech. This is a, a show, Display Week. It's part of the Society of Information Display. And it's their annual show to bring in a select group of vendors, as well as even folks like college students who are working on projects and they have separate zones where you can see some of the really cool cutting edge things they're working on. 
One of the cool things was at the show uh, was an updated version of something we saw back at CES from Hisense. And this was what they called their dual cell LCD technology. Effectively, you're using two LCD panels smashed together, one to handle the color and the other to handle the contrast. And the demo we've seen previously used a 4K panel up front for the 4K resolution and color. And then behind that screen was another LCD screen that was 1080p, allowing it then to modulate the backlight and to be able to really do near per pixel level control of how bright each pixel is or dark. Uh, very similar to what OLEDs are currently capable of in terms of producing that inky dark black where the pixel right next to it can be on at full blast without any kind of blooming or halo artifacts. This was simply showing yet another step up to it. Instead of using a 4K panel up front and a 1080p panel behind, they said, well, we've got this figured out pretty well. We're just going to go ahead and make it 4K all the way through. So each individual pixel on these TVs coming up will feature its own individual pixel just to moderate and modulate the light coming from the backlight system. What this will drive is something that is LCD technology, yet it is coming very, very close to what you get picture-wise out of an OLED, where you get that fantastic black level, you get decent, well, I'm not going to say, it, it's an LCD, so off-axis viewing is always going to be an issue, but it is really nice to have that per pixel level control, especially when you're looking at things like letterboxed movies or any content that has dark and bright content in it, because this thing is, on a per pixel level for an LCD, is able to just simply control light better than just about anything else I've seen. Big questions will be cost. I mean, does, how much more will it cost to actually sandwich a 4K panel to another 4K panel and make that all work fantastically? Uh, BOE is a Chinese manufacturer of panel technology, including LCDs and OLEDs, and they are the ones actually developing this panel with Hisense. And they're saying 2020. I want to say we'll probably see a demo of the 4K by 4K panel coming later this year. And overall, it was just impressive, even in its current state of the 4K and 2K panel. That's still a good level of control over per pixel lighting. And it just overall was just sweet and fantastic to spend some time uh, staring into. If you really want to look into the future, though, we're all talking 8K. And Japan Display Incorporated has been at the show for many years now, and they show off one of the coolest demos I think you'll be able to see anytime soon. And it's an AK panel about notebook size. I want to say it was about 17, 18 inches, 120 hertz, AK resolution, and full Rec 2020 color, which is about, let's see, DCI, which is used currently in your Blu-ray movies, is a larger set of color than you would have, say, with your regular HDR content, or uh, SDR content. And now 2020 is the full spec in terms of almost single wavelength primary colors, red, blue, and green being laser-like in terms of that level of saturation and that ability then to display that at 120 hertz with an AK panel. And they had moving content showing the difference between 60 and 120 hertz, and that was all cool. But really having that full color palette of Rec 2020, which nearly encompasses every color you can possibly see in life, it was the most and this is like something that the human eye can discern. This was the most window-like LCD I have ever looked at, and it was just delicious. It actually used a laser-based backlighting system in order to achieve some of those super saturated rich colors. Uh, another panel that's already on the market, but they were happy to show this off in comparison to other premium OLED TVs, was Vizio's P-Series Quantum X. This is an upgrade over the standard P-Series Quantum that's already out and about and a terrific value. 65 inch TV. They also have a 75 inch version. Big things about that will be the fact that it's dumping out close to 3000 nits of light output, supports all the HDR formats you like in terms of HDR 10, Dolby Vision. And it's just going to be a good value. Actually, the P series Quantum X is starting off where the original P series Quantum started in terms of its pricing. And we're already seeing in terms of like, if you go into Costco, they have the current version of the P-Series Quantum for about under 1500 bucks for that 65-inch version. This is just good value. I'm, I'm not the biggest fan, per se, of the uh, Chromecast-enabled TV apps that are in the Vizio TVs. It's, it's just sometimes it can be a little odd, like there is no native YouTube app. But in terms of TVs overall, that one was just utterly, for the money, it's one of the very brightest TVs out there. And it's going to be a very good good one to get in the lab and test out.
Otherwise, if you want that OLED LG C9, that is their least expensive flat panel flagship that has their latest second generation Alpha 9 processor. Fantastic. Uh, compared to absolute, uh, the absolute picture quality of this TV compared to the 2018 model, not dramatically different. In fact, if you could find the 2018, I guess it would be the C8 on sale at a really good price, don't, don't, don't feel too bad about not going with the C9. But if you do, you get some good updates, including some new calibration features if you're a super video nerd in terms of just being able to eke out the best picture quality possible. Better handling of HDR content uh, able to handle content that's been formatted for different luminance levels better. Uh, there's generally about three standards used in all of these 4K movies we're looking at, varying the brightness and the luminance output depending on how it was mastered. Uh, some, some authors are looking at content on monitors that only go so bright. So it's very hard for them to say, well, what would it look like if it were using the full spec of the HDR standard? And this in particular was just fantastic. Uh, beautiful picture quality overall. Now, if you're looking for LCD stuff, I will say the big thing about 8K TVs this year and right there is a picture of Samsung's Q900. That's their flagship 8K TV here in the United States. I think it's called the Q950 in Europe. That is a fantastically bright TV with some of the best upscaling I've seen to 8K. This demo, actually in that picture I was looking at, was several standard definition sources on, I think they were doing 480 on up to 1080 and just looking at how that scaled up to the AK panel. Considering we have very little AK TV out there, the Q900 is the AK version and they also have a Q90, that's their 4K version. Single coolest thing about, I think, Samsung's TVs, in addition to just pretty damn good image quality overall, is an anti-reflective layer that's on the front of their TVs. They're currently the best at producing a film material that does amazing work in terms of minimizing a, a bright light in the room that might be reflecting off the screen and into your eyes. It minimizes that more than anybody else's tech currently. And this is something you're going to see a lot of bright TVs adopt as we go forward over the next couple of years is what else can you improve? Yeah, minimizing reflection so you can see more of the screen and get more of that light into your eyes. And to me, those were just all just fantastic to look at. You know, Robert, while we have you, and it, it harkens back to a few weeks ago when a lot of people watching Game of Thrones said, I couldn't see the long night. It was too dark. Yeah. Of, of these TVs, these upcoming TVs, if I'm in the market for an 80 inch or thereabouts television, which I am, my, my Samsung TVs, you know, it's smart TV, but a little long in the tooth. Where would you point me if I, if price was a, a, the most, the biggest consideration? Okay. For, for what size screen? 80. 80. Well, the, yeah. NU, the NU8000, it's a 2018 Samsung TV. It's, I want to say 82 inches and it is 4k. It does support HDR formats, including HDR 10 and it, it uniquely among the among the non top tier TVs out of Samsung, it also supports an automatic game mode and automatic refresh rate control. So if you are into gaming and you don't like fiddling with the controls every time the TV flips into game mode or not, or having to do that manually, this is something you could really jump up and uh, take a look at. That is also just one of the best deals because once you get above say 75 inches for any LCD screen, it's suddenly just the price used to skyrocket. And yeah. I, I will say in the last two years and this year in particular, that's like, 75 and bigger is the new 65 in terms of pricing and availability. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping. It That's is. Answer, it is yeah. There are more 80 plus inch options now than we've ever had. And something like that 2018 NU8000 is still out there. It is under $2,000 and it's going to be very hard to find something you're going to get better image quality unless you're willing to spend at least twice as much. Well, good advice. Thank you, Robert. Thanks also to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. We have a group there, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. And uh, we've got one more question to get to Robert Heron from the mailbag, Sarah. Aww. We do. Don in St. Louis says, have a question. Hope Robert can answer. I haven't jumped into 4K TVs yet, but I am shopping. I get the sense that local dimming is an important feature to enhance HDR, but how much is enough? In mid-price TVs, I see local dimming zones between 10 and 120. 10 or 20 seems low on a 65-inch TV. Is there a rule of thumb to determine the minimum dimming zones based on screen size? 
full array local dimming. That's the first thing you really want to look at. Any TV that's advertising a dozen local dimming zones is an edge lit TV with some backlight control. When I talk about the backlight on an LCD television, it is literally LEDs either on the edges of the screen or one edge, or it's an array behind the screen. And that can be anywhere, like you said, from about 100 to three, four, five. I've seen micro LED demonstrations of five, 6,000 LEDs to get it to a more granular level of control over that backlight. If you're displaying like a space scene with some bright stars and planets and stuff on it, you don't want the dark, inky blackness of space being lit up full bore by that backlighting system. You want that to modulate down and then make that star punch up. But the big problem then becomes, can you control the blooming and other artifacts related to that within objects on the screen per pixel level control? More zones equal better control. So your better full array local dimming TVs like the latest, say the, the Q80 and the Q90 from Samsung and their, their AK models, of course, they have improved dramatically. Also want to say that P-Series Quantum X I just talked about, 384 zones of local dimming. That has a nice fine array of LEDs behind it that can all be individually modulated. And it does definitely improve image quality if you're already sitting front and center on those types of TVs. It will make a better looking viewing experience. One feature I see some LCD televisions incorporate is if you like those letterboxed movies, TVs like Samsung's better models will actually be able to turn off all the backlighting behind the black bars. So they get inky dark approaching what it looks like with an OLED, but usually at a larger screen size or a brighter screen all over overall. But be aware of anything that's edge lit. You are really limited to zones that are usually around a dozen or less. And they're stripes. They're not even blocks. You're actually doing like if the LED backlighting system's on the bottom edge of the screen and it's shooting straight up and there's like 25, 30 LEDs across the bottom, it's creating very like very striped zones that doesn't give you individual area control. So it's going to be okay. It's, it, it is what it is. So it, it definitely costs, <laughs> it costs less to do it that way compared to having, you know, three, four, 500 LEDs behind the screen, each being modulated individually, depending on the content. Well, Robert Heron, we could talk about this <laughs> all day. Unfortunately, we can't. However, for everybody who's, who, who, who's very interested in learning more, where can they keep up with all of your work? Yeah, take a look at my old website that's going away soon. Thank goodness, I'm almost done with this. <laughs> that's my website, though. You can hit it up at heronfidelity.com. If you really want to ping me, look me up on Twitter, at Robert Heron. Or you can check me out on AVXL with my buddy Patrick Norton when we get our podcasting on related to all things home theater. And Folks, if you want to keep this kind of content coming, be sure to become a member and support us. It is the majority way the show is funded at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you want to send us an email, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to do it. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more and tell a friend at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Always so good with the. Oh, uh, so good. I'm going to get a new television. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, though, if, if, if you have room for an 80 inch screen, sure. Yeah. Also, consider if you're going to spend two grand on like the least expensive, worth it 80 inch screen, yeah. consider, consider a projector. There are so many superb projectors out there that cost a, a fraction of that cost. You think that, so? If you have a room that can do it, definitely do it. I mean, I do. I do. I basically have a, a wall that I have a 55 right now. And it's not a big wall, but it it's sort of like every time I look at it, I'm like, it should just be the whole wall should be the television. I hear you. You I, know, I just I just see it in my head. So that's what I want. I swapped up a 55 to a 65 in a smaller room and I felt in no way that it was too big. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I mean the 80 is it's a little it's a little silly. But if but you have a friend of mine has one and space. like I was over at his house the other day and I'm like, I just want it. I want it. I've been in 
if you have a larger living room, you definitely should be looking at bigger screens. They just fill the area better, and, and you already have the room for it. Cost is always going to be the issue. Granted, yeah. Yeah, I love the I love the Q nine hundred from Samsung at like eighty some inches, but what's that? Seven grand, eight grand. Yeah, like, <laughs> not, what's not what's, or, what's or a what's, seventy-seven inch OLED is going to buy two HP backpack VRs for that? What's <laughs> what's the sweet spot like in size in terms of like like where is it? Is it a fifty inch? Is it a fifty six? You know, I like, mean, you don't hear a, a price a, a whole lot like in terms it. of value where you get like where where the value and the size no in per dollar. What's the best value? Sixty-five. If 65 you're looking for inches. something bigger than fifty, fifty-five and sixty-five are the most commonly made TVs right now. Yeah. Uh, I doubt they're the biggest selling. You're still in the sub fifty-five category. They're, well, you that's know what's funny is popular. when I moved to the apartment that I live in now, I had somebody come over to mount my t television, you know, because I can't do it. And, uh, you know, they asked beforehand, you know, what size and, you know, give give me some specs so we know what to bring. I said 65 and he came and he looked at my TV and he's like, this isn't a 65, it's a 55. And I was like, it is? Oh, all right. I can move up quite a bit. So maybe if I got a 65, it would still seem significantly mm -hmm. larger. I mean, budget permitting, 65 inches, the LG OLED is going to be the best piece of eye candy yeah. you ever look at. That's but what I've it, got. <laughs> that, it, it's just it, every day. Every day you're going to love that thing. Just, and, I mean, it, it, there's, a, there's nothing more fun than a new television. I, but I will say the new the new Samsungs are looking good. Actually, yeah. even TCL, if you really want a good value, their new 2019 S series, I think they have an S4 now. That is not HDR really. Uh, it, I don't believe it even has a wide color palette, but it has that Roku interface. It's like two hundred and fifty bucks for a. a wow, 40, that's another thing. Forty nine inch like, screen. The smart like, TV crazy. capabilities of this is, it, are, you know, sometimes on paper they sound good, but in practice, how many people are using their smart TV? I'll, I'll tell you who I see not using it is on a lot of the TVs driven with the Android operating system. They can become sluggish over time, Yeah. or there's just certain features not there that you wanna use. And I see a lot of people just simply going to, you know, whatever you're, whatever you're currently using, be it an Apple TV or a streaming product of any kind, uh, whoever you're happy with, is gonna be the cheapest way to just to avoid that mess. That's right. another reason I kind of like the TCL stuff for their Roku integration. They actually, the whole operating system's done by Roku, so. It's about as simple and fantastic as it is to get set up and use in terms of just being able to use the apps you want when you want without without it getting in the way. It's just uh, I have a lot of a lot of praise from them there. But for myself personally, I just simply I could almost care less what's built into the TV and then I'll just use my favorite streaming. Oh, totally. Yeah, I, yeah. I, that's why I asked. I'm like, I don't use apps, native apps on my television, but where, where I would change it up maybe would be in the case of something like LG's OLEDs where their web OS based operating system is just slicker than snot okay. and it works well. They support every app I want. All of the little format support things like, oh, I want to watch Netflix and Dolby Vision. That's all right there. You don't even have to think about it. Just hit the button and go. That's when I end up using my smart TV because I have an LG OLED and I will use it for things where I am where I don't have an app capable of it on a set-top box, on a Roku or an Apple TV. Um, so like, give me an example. Becomes, well, when I first got it, I didn't have a 4K capable Roku or Apple TV. They existed, but I just didn't have that. So yeah. I would use the apps there. But yeah, so so Dolby Vision, surround sound, stuff like that. Or there's some apps that are available on the LG that are not on the Apple TV. Uh, they are available on Roku, but I end up using Fandango now on the LG because with Roku, it's built into the operating system, which makes it kind of clunky to use, and it's not even available on the Apple TV. So that's one that I'm I'm always using it on on the LG Web OS. And like you said, Robert, that that's a really clean OS. It is. That was the best thing they bought, and to this day, I would say that the latest version of Samsung's operating system, their Tizen-based OS on their TVs, is about as good as it gets. But if you're going to ask me to pick and choose. LG has that magic remote and it literally acts like a mouse cursor on the screen. And huh. I love that interface. That is the fact I just end up head. using the arrow keys though, because I'm like, ah, my hand's too shaky. I'm it's faster. faster. I, I do use both hands. So, I so, so yeah. are Stop you, making are, so much coffee. are you of the opinion that like, if you were just going to buy a brand new TV, like you just moved into a new room and you don't have a TV. Yeah. Like, like just, you would just TV. get a 4k HDR I, capable set. I, I'd get a 65 inch OLED unless that's not big enough or if that's not in the budget. And then but I, a 4K then I, OLED. 
not there just are, the, yeah there's nothing else at this point yeah. everything's 4k yeah 8k yeah. is 8k is where it becomes more more important when you're talking the 80 plus inch screens it it gives it a more seamless look but then you're paying for all of that also there might be features in there that you're simply not going to use like that 2019 lg oled i just mentioned it has it has the latest hdmi spec built into all of its ports you although it was listed initially at being able to do 4k 120 input it currently doesn't do that, and that would likely be added later on. But if you're looking at those features, you're looking at being able to take the apps that are built into the TV and then fire that audio, Dolby Atmos, full-blown, right back to an AVR that's compatible. All of that technology is now built in. So if you're future-proofing yourself a little more, maybe sure, that would be you're but right. if, it's just yeah. straight, if it's just straight image quality and all you need is a monitor... That's where you can get in to save some money a little bit. That, and that's where my problem has been. I moved into this house and it's got a, a home theater built into the you know the the living room basement area. So I've got an entire wall to use for projector projection screen, and I got power in the ceiling to mount the projector. But I don't have any. It have to be a wireless interface. And I'm always weary because every time I start researching, I'm like, oh, they're about ready to update the spec and about ready to do this. And well. It's just, that's when it gets confusing. I did a setup using Epson's. Uh, they have any projector they make currently. If it ends with that E, like the UBE, it includes a breakout box that is a HDMI wireless transmitter to the projector. Currently, and it does use 60 gigahertz technology, so it is slightly compressed, but I would say visually indistinguishable from lossless. However, I'm not certain if it'll do anything above, say, like 4K24 for you know, 4K sources. So for 1080p, 60 and whatever, it's going to be fantastic. But that is a way to have wireless input or as long as the projector has power, you're good to go. Also, all of these projectors typically have a USB port that you could then take a streaming stick of choice from any manufacturer, just stick it in the back of the thing and power it off the USB port. And there you go. Uh, you don't even need to run a cable to it, really. Well, but on duct tape, you can even put an Apple TV on it. Anything you want, <laughs> but I don't. But then you have to worry about the, getting the audio to the speakers that are mounted in the wall in front of the room. Like it's, mm. yeah. Well, that would just be it. Would be that would be coming from the source device. So say it was like a Blu-ray player, or in mm. the case if it were going to be a wireless transmission to a projector on the ceiling, you would probably want a separate box for like a, a, a Roku or Apple TV or whatever, then you could have the audio go to the AVR and the video being sent appropriately out to the display. Speaking of speaking of audio, Robert, just because I have you, um, I'm sort of <laughs> I, I'm sort of in the market for a sound bar and I'm I, I yeah. was looking at the Sonos because I've already yeah. got Sonos all over my house. Yeah. I mean I be the beam seems like a good option. I've been living with the beam for about six months now and yeah. it's not leaving my TV anytime soon. I just did the update to Google assistant. Which yeah. I was yeah, happy yeah. to be able to even have that option. Uh, I really don't use voice assistants, but I do appreciate the button on the top of the beam that lets me turn off the microphone altogether. So audio quality wise, especially if you're an iOS user, Sonos is some of the best products out there for the money. I mean, yeah, you will not be disappointed. And in the case of IO, the iOS app, it has a room tuning application built into it where you literally use your phone as a listening microphone and it further optimizes that speaker for your given room environment. And you can toggle it on and off. And I've always found it did a pretty good job. Yeah, I, I for my Sonos ones, um, when I moved to my latest apartment, it because we have some weird uh, ceilings here, you know, a lot of slopes and just kind yeah. of funny angles. And it did make a difference, made a real difference. And if you're already using uh, the, the Play Ones, perhaps you could also link those in to be surround sound speakers and using mm -hmm. something like the Beam as your front three channels or, or however you want to do it. Yeah, we've talked about. On, Down the uh, road, you could throw in a yeah. wireless sub. I mean, that's nice exactly. to do. Value wise, there is absolutely nothing wrong with Vizio soundbars. They start at about 80 bucks. I would go for one that has a wireless subwoofer with it. Uh, and, you know, that's a good starting point. Obviously, if you can go with something like Dolby Atmos with ceiling speakers and the whole nine sure. yard, that's hey, going to sound 80 amazing. bucks sounds pretty good too. Yeah. You know, all things yeah. considered, it's going to sound better than any TV speakers. And if you have somebody who might have a listening, uh, inability to hear dialogue clearly or things like that. These devices can really go a long way toward helping. Just to We're going to wrap up stuff. our video right there. Uh, the show today, if you were wondering, is called TVs Pushing the Edges. 
Uh, GDI will likely be called man rats. Video people, thanks for watching. Audio folks, stick around. There's more to come. <laughs>